so you can start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are just waiting on an additional speaker um, and we will get started in just a moment. Um, in the meantime, uh, let's just go ahead and do a, um, a, a sound check for the presenters. Um, Roland, you want to say something to make sure that we hear you? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Tom? Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Devin? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Cynthia? Yes, Cynthia, we can't hear you. Well, we just had Cynthia and now we don't. I can text her. That's what Larry started. Him and I had a call on the set up yesterday after her. Then we pushed back and talked about the Okay, and do we have um do we have Ron, our parent yet? Sort of, they're joining me in the room I'm in, so. Okay, okay, we'll okay. Yeah, and I still do not have um, sound from Cynthia. Hey all, yeah, I'm, I can't get my uh, air there buds to connect okay. in. Okay, great, I hear you now, Cynthia. And, and Cynthia, it looks like you're connected to the owl still. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Yep, just FYI. There we go. Perfect. Devin, just let me know when they're there and we can get started. They're here with me. We're just not sure how to work the audio and video uh, with three people in one room, but we'll we'll sort it. Okay. Alrighty. You can play musical chairs. Yes. Sure. <laughs> All righty. I'll, I'll, let's I'll go switch ahead. my laptop around. We'll make it work. Perfect, sir. Thank you. All righty. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the progress update regarding the Lower Snake River Water Replacement Study. I'm Michael Coffey. I'm with Reclamation, the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, in the spirit of our commitment to remain transparent, we will be providing you with a status on the development of this very important study. This meeting is in listen-only format, and there will be no opportunity for questions at the end of this presentation. However, please feel free to visit our website uh, where there is a link uh, to submit questions. Additionally, this meeting will be recorded and placed on our website. Today, you will hear from Roland Springer with Reclamation, Tom Tebb with the Washington Department of Ecology, and finally with the Jacobs Group, who's conducting the study. Uh, thank you for your participation. And Roland, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to you right now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michael. And again, uh, apologies, folks, while we had a little bit of technical difficulties on the call. Uh, but we thank you all for joining today and for your interest in the water supply replacement study. Uh, again, my name is Roland Springer. I'm a deputy regional director uh, with the Bureau of Reclamation's Columbia Pacific Northwest region. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, first, I will go over the agenda. Uh, just in summary, we will very briefly go over the background on why we're doing this study, uh, the Reclamation Ecology Partnership, and how this study relates to other studies. Um, then we'll share the study schedule. Uh, both of these things we've shared publicly before, but we want to make sure uh, you have that information as a reminder. Uh, then the majority of the presentation will be by our consulting team uh, for the progress update uh, led by Jacobs Engineering. And then at the end, we'll share the future opportunities for engagement and uh, uh, show the contact information uh, for questions or comments. Next slide, please. So, first of all, just a reminder of the federal uh, commitment. Um, this, this traces back to the Columbia River System Operations EIS and Record of Decision, as well as Biological Opinions in 2020 and subsequent litigation. Um, through the litigation and the discussions we have, we reached a, me a mediated agreement on December 14th of last year, and then the litigation stay uh, was filed in the court in February of this year. Uh, the agreement we, we term the Resilient Columbia Basin Agreement. In that agreement, there was a uh, US government commitment, a uh, number of commitments related to the Lower Snake River dams. The one we are focused on, and that is the focus of this study, is uh, the water supply replacement study. And, uh, you see the quote there uh, from the agreement, uh, how it talks about we how we will uh, conduct this study and do that in coordination with the state of Washington. And the intent is to address irrigation, municipal and industrial withdrawals as associated with the potential breach of the four Lower Snake River dams if authorized by Congress. We did commit to um, have the outreach and analysis completed by late 2024 and uh, our plan is to have that draft document the draft report um, shared out uh, by the end of this year at, for review in early 2025. I will mention that the report is this this work is funded through the bipartisan infrastructure law aquatic ecosystems restoration program on the federal side and uh, maybe I'll turn it over to Tom now to discuss a little bit on the um, the state side and our partnership. Great, thanks Roland. I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and proceed. I uh, just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the state's commitment. Um, coming out of the Governor Inslee, Senator Murray uh, report around the potential removal of the Lower Snake River dams and studying the impacts associated with that potential um, a variety of reports and, and studies were recommended, and this is one of them, the water supply replacement study. Um, we, we uh, uh, the Department of Ecology, were notified that there was a budget proviso uh, in the operating budget of 2023. Um, we uh, were given, the Office of Columbia River was given the direction to start uh, the process for a contractor solicitation. The budget proviso provided $250,000 for us to initiate a contract with an option for another $250,000 if we needed it in 2025. So we were moving in that process. We were moving in that direction. Uh, in fact, we had almost opened up the solicitation process. In fact, I think we had, and we had uh, had to close that. Uh, once we had heard that the uh, U.S. government and the six sovereigns had um, made a, a mediated agreement in December of 2023, we thought it best uh, to, to pause there. And, and we, we discussed this at the governor's office, as well as with Director Watson and others. And the state felt like it probably was in the best interest to have a single report as opposed to two reports, one from the state, one from the federal government on this issue. So we uh, engaged with the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, and discuss an opportunity to work together through a memorandum of agreement. Uh, and then subsequently we move forward with that. Um, in February, we were able to, to conclude that process early March and then uh, reclamation hit the ground running with uh, their, their contract solicitation process. So um, just wanted to provide a little background as to the state's commitment for this work and, and moving forward in partnership with the reclamation. Thank you. 
Thanks, Tom. And uh, I, I will also mention that we greatly appreciate the participation of the uh, state of Washington Department of Ecology. Uh, their participation is really, really helping strengthen the study. Uh, and I will also recognize we are um, dealing with um, water supplies, both in the state of Idaho and state of Washington. So we're including information for both states in this. Uh, moving to this slide, uh, there were a number of questions that have come up as our consultant team has gone out uh, and um, shared information and gathered information uh, from water users along uh, the Lower Snake River. And so this slide is inserted to, to summarize um, how this is a, a part of a large continuum. You can see uh, on the left side of the slide uh, how we had the uh, listings on the uh, Endangered Species Act listings of Snake River Salmon is still head in the 90s. Um, some litigation and uh, that litigation and uh, a, ver a variety of uh, federal documents and studies have been completed um, all the way up through 2023 as we have continued to work on this issue. So as I mentioned in an earlier slide, in December we had the agreement on uh, the current uh, set of round of litigation and uh, the U.S. government made commitments uh, for benefit replacement studies related to the Lower Snake River dams. You see the, the four uh, blue vertical circles which which describe the four studies uh, that are being completed by agencies now. Uh, the water supply replacement study is the one we are talking about in this presentation. Then separately, the Corps of Engineers is working on uh, the ta transportation and recreation analyses, and the uh, Department of Energy is working on the energy needs analysis. As, as shown in the call out box, uh, this study does not take a position on dam breaching, nor is it a decision document, but is it's laying out technical information on how the water supply is currently uh, enabled uh, or, or assisted by those uh, lower Snake River dams could be replaced or modified to continue uh, the water deliveries that exist now. And then over on the right side, um, the, the information from these studies, as well as other work that's being done, could be included in future analyses and decision making. So move to the next slide, please. Now I'll hand it over to Ron from the Jacobs team. Uh, Ron Ferringer, thank you for being with us today. We appreciate uh, the, this, uh, the, our consultants' assistance and their hard work on this project. And uh, it's over to you now, Ron. Thanks, Roland. And my screen probably says Devin Stoker because we're joining together and uh, sharing his computer. Um, but yeah, I'm Ron Ferringer. I'm uh, the Jacobs project manager for the, our support of reclamation and ecology on this study. Just a quick review of our overall schedule here. Um, started the work uh, late spring in early May and um, been doing you know this tribal and public information uh, session uh, stuff. Uh, back in June and uh, now again quite a bit this week. Uh, on the water user interviews, the site visits have been going on uh, and there's a, still a few of those going on as of right now. Uh, study sections one and two, and we'll get into those here in a little bit as far as the details there. It's been going on for several months and you know we're getting close to complete um, and including water availability analysis and water supply. Study sections three and four are very active right now, uh, wrapping up this fall, and we'll have uh, some slides on that here in a little bit. And then we have reporting and so forth to be uh, going on uh, late this fall and into uh, the winter. We're on track to have a public draft available at the end of the year. And, um, you know, what we're putting together is, is a draft. and. Uh, material will be presented for public uh, review and and consumption here after the first of the year. Um, so I guess uh, I'll go ahead and have you flip to the next slide. So at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Cynthia uh, Karlstad, who's our public outreach lead and uh, been taking the lead on uh, site visits and interviews and you know just basically gathering 
helping us gather information and uh, meet up with folks. And, and Cynthia, go ahead and take it away from there, please. Yeah, thanks, Ron. And just a quick sound check. Can you guys hear me OK? Yes. OK, great, great. Yeah, just having a little audio difficulty here. Um, so talking with um, those who rely on water from the Lower Snake River um, is one of the fundamental data inputs to our study. Um, so we've put a good amount of effort into this, both um, in a concentrated fashion early on. Um, it was really the first task that we kicked off. Um, it was really trying to get um, interviews with as many folks as we could possibly reach. Um, but I want to really emphasize that this is an ongoing effort. Um, we are very interested in talking with anybody who um, is interested in talking with us, um, gathering as much information about um, how people use water, what they feel is important um, in sustaining that water use um, for the needs that they have. So um, my email is on the last slide in this presentation. I would really welcome anyone who is out there who um, would would like to talk to, with us. Um, contact me, please, and we'll we'll get something scheduled. Um, so we've we've conducted um, over 20 interviews at this point with a, a variety of of different individuals and roles. Um, those include landowners, producers, sometimes land managers, um, industrial and municipal water users, as well as um, industry groups. Um, and those interviews have. Um, included myself, but also um, the subject matter technical experts from our team. So hydrologists, engineering, um, uh, economics, um, you know, so the whole kind of comprehensive suite of, of technical um, topic areas, water rights. Um, so it's been a really, um, really great opportunity for us to, to really fully understand um, both how people use water, how they would view, um, you know, the needs um, should a, a, a dam breach um, be, be advanced and just all of what would, would need to be considered, um, as well as indirect effects, um, which is, is very important. Um, and some of the, uh, you know, some of the findings so far, uh, particularly in the McNary and um, Ice Harbor pool areas, the the agricultural uses in this area are very very multi layered and and complex. Um, so there are, you know, in any given situation, there may be a landowner, uh, a grower who's leasing. There may be land managers. Um, there are crop rotation considerations. Um, there are processors who are affected by this. Um, so there are there are a lot of different considerations and a lot of different entities that would need to be involved um, in any transition to a new water uh, water source. Um, in addition, the cost to irrigate is very fundamental from an economic standpoint. So that if um, it, you know if if post dam breach, um, in that in that case, if um, if energy costs to bring water to a parcel of land were increased by you know some percentage, um, you know that that ongoing cost of that is a concern, and as to who would be paying for that, how that would enter into the economics and viability of a farming operation. Um, so that is a, a very very important um, factor for um, most people who farm in that area. We've heard concerns about um, options that may uh, focus on a groundwater replacement option, particularly in areas um, in the eastern part of the study area, Idaho in particular. There are um, there are already groundwater declines, so concerns around um, moving more usage to groundwater. And of course, you know the difference between annual crops and perennial crops, orchards and vineyards. Um, you know the consequences and implications, the the time to recover um, from a loss um, in those perennial crops is just much more. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, other topics, of course. Um, the transition period is something that we um, wanted to talk in detail with more more about with each of the folks that we interviewed. Um, and this is a, a topic of that is, of course, of, of great concern, understanding um, the uncertainties around that, um, the, the immediate needs of being able to switch over to a new source that's reliable um, and unforeseen consequences that might um, 
you know, that that might really impact people's ability to carry out their business. Uh, so that's that's definitely something that we've heard um, quite a bit about. Um, We've heard about um, downstream impacts of breaching both, both um, kind of the, the physical uh, considerations, things like, you know, sedimentation, water quality, um, a, a, a more dynamic or shifting riverbed, um, economic hardships that might come from um, that situation, um, including, um, you know, we understand that emergency food supplies are provided by some of the, the agriculture that um, is conducted in this area and any interruption in that would have um, significant impacts to uh, populations that rely on on those. Uh, security of water rights is, of course, a, a concern, and um, um, primarily in the Lewiston-Clarkson area, there there is um, a, a lot of infrastructure that is integrated with the river as it is it, it, as it is now with the Upper Granite Pool, um, and that um, that includes a levee and, and stormwater drainage system. Um, there are also wastewater discharges, the mixing zones, things like that that would need to be considered. Um, so just just a, a sampling of some of the some of the feedback that we've heard during our water user um, interviews. And again, I would just really encourage folks, we are continuing this effort uh, because we have the technical team involved in these interviews. Um, there's, you know, there, there, there is a, a capacity on our side, you know, that we're needing to cover a lot of bases, but we are very interested in all the input that we can get from um, the potentially affected water user community out there. So again, my email is on that last slide. Um, feel free to just email me directly and we'll get something set up. Um, next slide. And then I think I'm, I'm turning it over to Devin. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. And uh, just just to reiterate, um, you know, we're a lot of our update today is going to be kind of focused on uh, providing some a sneak peek at some some preliminary content on on study sections that we've been advancing since we first uh, uh, spoke with the public in in late June. Um, that that presentation back in June was was really an overview of the study. If you were able to to attend those meetings and listen, if not, I'd encourage you to to go to the project website. There's a link on the last slide. Um, as was mentioned, and and listen to those uh, presentation recordings. But um, the the bulk of the the update today is kind of focused on uh, some of these study sections. So we're we're not going to kind of rehash uh, what those study sections entail, but in, try try to kind of dig into some of the detail. Uh, I will caveat what we're presenting today is still a work in progress. Um, uh, as as each day goes by, we're still uh, refining our analysis and updating updating this content. So none of this has been finalized yet. Um, but the first thing we set out to do uh, in in parallel with our outreach work that Cynthia just reviewed is to kind of understand the water user community, uh, and the physical and legal water supply within the Lower Snake River system. Uh, this this understanding is crucial for assessing the potential effects of uh that that would would occur on water users if the four lower snake river dams are are breached and this understanding is vital for developing effective replacement solutions for these users and so this really becomes kind of foundational to our to our study and so to understand the scope of water use within the study area we reviewed water rights data which are shown here on this map uh, this shows authorized and claimed water use in the state of washington as well as uh, adjudicated water rights in idaho uh, we did screen out inactive water rights applications and 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 change applications. Uh, remove those from the analysis because they're not current uses. Um, and then I would I would note here this is kind of a it, it's pretty clear uh, visual. Uh, there's a there's a big chunk of water usage down there by the McNary Pool shown on this map, and uh, we are gathering uh, usage data on on water users out of the McNary Pool. Uh, not necessarily for the same technical reasons as we are on water users out of the pools behind the four lower Snake River dams. Uh, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more on that on, uh, on the next slide. So uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So uh, this 
this slide really just summarizes the, the points of diversion or points of withdrawal by reach um, and uh, our attempt to quantify the acreages served by each type of, of diversion or withdrawal. Uh, these tables show how much of the irrigated acreage really skews towards that Ice Harbor and McNary uh, area. And uh, so you see a much higher, uh, you can also see a higher number of groundwater wells above lower granite dam, but the, the lack of corresponding irrigation use is kind of a clue that there's a more of a municipal and industrial uh, skew in that portion of the study area. Um, and as, as I mentioned on my previous slide there, uh, we're, we're collecting data for water rights and infrastructure in the McNary pool due to uh, primarily potential issues associated with existing surface water intakes that uh, we expect could be impacted by potential dam breaching. Next slide. So uh, to try and summarize uh, what we're finding relative to irrigation water use, it's really the prevailing use of water on the Lower Snake River, uh, with the exception of uh, water in the Lower Granite Pool. Um, our team's using multiple sets of, of data from multiple sources. Uh, we're looking at crop data from uh, USDA and Washington State Department of Ag, uh, multiple years of crop data, uh, pulling that into uh, GIS and and what we're doing with that data is relating the the water rights data, the points of diversion, points of withdrawal to corresponding places of use uh, it, with the intent of sorting out how and when water is being used on a crop by crop and location specific basis. Uh, that's that's a very oversimplified summary, but that's that's kind of what we're getting at relative to the irrigation water use. And uh, next slide. For other uses like municipal and industrial water use, uh, we can look at water right attributes and identify rights that have a domestic or municipal purpose. And we combine that data with other sources from, for example, the state of Washington Department of Health or uh, Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, community water systems uh, to get a to get a, a sense for what those uh, for what those uses might be, uh, and one one thing that we're definitely not wanting to ignore are the permit exempt wells in the study area that could be impacted by something like this. Uh, so you know, in, in diff different um, different codes in both states of Washington and Idaho. Um, but that we, we've got a, a workflow down for that to identify parcels that might be served by an exempt well also. Next slide. And then last, but uh, certainly not least important element of this uh, first study section number one is uh, our economic analysis. And so I, I know this is going to garner a lot of interest. Uh, the point of this exercise is to uh, quantify the economic benefits associated with the water supply that result from the current configuration of the Lower Snake River dams. And so uh, this is a really complex analysis that warrants more than one slide. Uh, but in simple terms, we're taking data from previous research and, and studies and efforts uh, using crop budgets developed by uh, ag extensions, for example. And uh, what, what we're doing is we're calculating the net farm returns that we can attribute to the water supply itself. So these are direct use benefits uh, that we're using to, again, quantify those economic benefits. Um, in addition to those results, we also are completing a regional economic analysis using a model called implan. And, and that portion of the analysis looks at interactions in the economy that uh, ripple into other sectors. Uh, the intent there is to estimate the broader economic impact on the regional economy, on, on things like jobs, income, uh, other, uh, other met metrics and parameters. So that, that accounts not only for the direct impacts, but also indirect impacts or, or, or the ripple effect, if you will, and the induced impacts that result from from potential changes. So 
before I move on here from study section one, one thing I really want to underscore uh, specific to this economics topic is that we're we're simply trying to understand the magnitude of the economic benefits that uh, would be impacted with this broader topic. Uh, we're not looking at all benefits provided by the dams as they're currently configured, and we're not looking at all benefits that could potentially result from dam breaching either. Um, you could kind of look back on that uh, last slide Roland presented and uh, with the, the timeline and, and, you know, with the understanding that this focused is solely, this, this study's focused solely on water supply. So we're not, the, the intent of this analysis is not to provide economic justification for, for any decision making on dam breaching or, or not dam breaching. That's that's really something that would uh, warrant a more comprehensive uh, assessment of economic feasibility, taking into account a lot of other factors that are well beyond the scope of this study. So just wanted to kind of vocalize that and make sure that that's as clear as possible. Um, so that kind of summarizes what what we're doing in study section one. And if we go to the next slide, I'll dive into study section two here. Um, so, you know, once we kind of understand the current water supply, study section two is really intended to help us understand the availability of surface water and groundwater resources. And so we're, we're doing that through the lens of short term and long term variability. So, you know, year to year within the year, that temporal component and also spatial variability. Um, so on the next slide, uh, I'll dive in here to Kind of focus on surface water availability and uh, we put together this uh, simplified flow process diagram to try and convey how we leverage existing data to develop information that could be useful for this step and uh, for folks familiar with previous environmental compliance documents that crso mo3 bullet there that's the columbia river systems operations eis mo3 the multiple objective number three alternative of dam breaching. Um, so there's hydrologic data associated with that modeling effort. That was a very, very comprehensive analysis in 2020. Instead of just copying and pasting that, uh, what, what we're doing here is we're actually combining it with several other uh, data sets and uh, in a nutshell, uh, we're also looking at the, the change associated with uh, future climate change projections and then taking that, uh, putting it in the hopper and cranking out some water surface profiles and associated elevations and depths uh, for, again, a range of flows and climate change scenarios. Um, really fun but technical analysis uh, to, to get us some some valuable information to understand uh, the availability of water uh, in, in the Lower Snake River moving forward. So that's really what I'm gonna be presenting here on the next several slides. If we can flip to the next one here. Uh, this is kind of a sneak peek of what our analysis is indicated at this point in time. Um, this, this figure here shows uh, median flows for the period of record and as you can see, uh, there's there's actually four lines on this graph. They're they're very very tight, uh, and what what this kind of indicates is that there's at the scale we're talking about very little variation in flow from Lower Granite down to Ice Harbor. We know there's tributary flows in between these four dams, but for the most part, there's uh, not a whole lot of variation going on. And so, for simplicity's sake. Uh, most of our analysis focus on it focuses on inflows to lower granite uh, to err on the conservative side and, and use those for simplicity's sake. So uh, next slide. Our climate change analysis uh, confirmed what uh, you might expect to see given what we know about how atmospheric rivers and reduced snowpack and, and other uh, climate change uh, effects are impacting surface water. So over a range of flows here, you see from a 10 percentile hydrograph to 50 percentile to 90 percentile, the uh, 
hydrograph shifts to the left from that black line, which is baseline to the colored lines, which represent uh, various climate change projections that we uh, included in our analysis. So you see the hydrograph shift to the left earlier in the year and uh, higher on the on the scale. And um, I want to call your attention to that uh, highlighted number at the bottom center of the slide. Uh, one of the 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 minimum flow numbers there for one of the future climate change scenarios uh, out in the year 2070 for the 10 percentile dry water year is on the order of uh, 13,800 CFS. It's a slight reduction from, from baseline conditions. That's entirely attributable to climate change, has nothing to do with, with dam breaching, but just keep that number in the back of your mind because uh, it, it's, it's important for kind of some of the takeaways from this uh, study section two and, and what we're learning. Next slide. So while flows don't really change, what does change, obviously, if the dams are breached is, is the water surface profile along the Lower Snake River. So you can see here, we, we've got 140 river mile long graph of, of the river, and you see those orange uh, lines representing the flat pools behind the dams. And so what would change again is uh, the, where those pool levels uh, would drop if the dams are breached and the river were restored to a, a free flowing state and flow regime. Uh, we're, we're seeing those pools drop. Water surface elevations could, could drop anywhere from 35 to 120 feet, depending on location and, and flow rate. Next slide. Uh, a couple slides here now uh, to kind of speak to the groundwater uh, topic. Um, understanding that is also really important for us. So we've got a team of uh, expert hydrogeologists. They've been spending weeks and weeks coming through literally hundreds, if not thousands of well logs to assign specific aquifer units to, um, to, to, to data that they're appending to the USGS's uh, CPRAS or Columbia Plateau Regional Aquifer System model. Um, and that, that's a that's a fairly large scale, uh, relatively coarse model, but uh, the intent there is to simulate current conditions and then post breach conditions to understand the potential impacts of of potential dam breaching um, at a relatively conservatively low flow. Uh, so they edit that boundary condition at the at the Lower Snake River. And we see what the what the impacts to groundwater wells are. And so the next slide is kind of a graphical representation of what that might look like. Um, again, this this is a figure that's still a work in progress. It's going to be revised with additional data as uh, as we speak. We've got engineers combing through well logs, and we're going to be rerunning our model. But our initial results indicate that declines in groundwater levels following uh, potential dam breaching would approach about 12.3 feet within one mile of the of the subject river reach, uh, with the greatest declines uh, being near the Saddle Mountains basalt near Pasco, and then in the Grand Ronde basalt near uh, Clarkston. So estimated declines um, are, are really fairly limited uh, with this sort of analysis because of you know limited hydraulic continuity between those deeper aquifers and and the snake river along this reach um, so you know as as with any modeling effort there are limitations and uncertainties that influence these results but we're documenting all of that um, a lot of prior studies uh, past EISs have have presented groundwater impact analyses that were were quite limited to some pretty simplified assumptions of hydraulic continuity with the Snake River, uh, and and reviews of extremely small subsets of of well logs and assumptions that groundwater declines would be fairly significant relative to the level of pool declines, uh, and and this analysis you know again this 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 CPRAS groundwater model represents the best available science that we're aware of and the most current representation of the hydrogeologic framework at this scale, uh, which admittedly is a large scale. 
um, but we believe it represents the first numerical groundwater modeling effort completed to kind of evaluate the potential impacts of dam breaching on groundwater users adjacent to this reach of the Snake River. Uh, next slide. So this is this is our uh, conclusion here for study section two. Uh, just to kind of point out what we're again where we're at, summarize and conclude where we're at. We're still working on updating and refining our analysis and and the report and exhibits um, to kind of set the stage for future study sections and and build on those. I I want to again kind of highlight that second bullet here which is that all indications are that the availability of water in the Lower Snake River far exceeds existing demands. So that minimum flow number I shared a few slides back, 13,800 CFS, um, we're still refining numbers and turning some knobs on some models, but that's roughly an order of magnitude higher than the sum of the existing authorized water uses in our, in our study area. So, uh, you know, at a regional scale, the water supply question really becomes one that isn't, uh, is there enough water, but is there enough infrastructure in place to continue to put it to good use? And uh, with that, I'm going to pass the mic off to my colleague, Perrin Robinson, who was our lead for the next two study sections. So I'm going to slide my chair over and let him come sit in front of my computer. Hi, uh, Perrin Robinson, Jacobs Engineering, and uh, appreciate the uh, understanding of our technical uh, challenges. But uh, anyway, we we're making it work. So, anyway, wanted to share a little bit uh, about what we've got going on in study sections three and four. Uh, with, as shown on the screen here, study section three, uh, focusing on uh, those potential solutions for the water supply replacement uh, that Devin, Devin just mentioned. Um, and so we're taking a, you know, taking a look at the uh, four pools in the Lower Snake River as a system and individually. And uh, we were tasked with, uh, those of you that joined us on a previous uh, information session heard, heard us use the words, trying to think uh, creatively, identify uh, ideas uh, that could be potential solutions. And so uh, our, our team did just that, and we came up with, as you see on the slide here, 38 potential ideas. Uh, we got together uh, with reclamation uh, uh, folks and uh, Department of Ecology folks in a workshop setting, um, talked through all 38, some of the merits uh, of, you know, of those, and uh, with the intent of really uh, trying to hone in on a, a smaller subset that we would then apply more focus to in terms of developing uh, appraisal level designs or conceptual designs. Um, so we did that, uh, we, we, we narrowed it, that down uh, and these ideas are to, uh, we're gonna be developing solutions for both uh, the groundwater users, uh, presenting some, some concepts there uh, and then also surface water users. Um, so, because of the work that we, uh, Devin presented on in terms of water uh, availability and kind of the last slide that he uh, presented on, really that, that key takeaway that there is water available in, in the Snake River, Lower Snake River. Um, we are not, you know, our solutions uh, that we're developing designs around uh, do not involve uh, importing or bringing water in from another source. Uh, utilizing uh, the surface water available in the Lower Snake River for, for these uh, water supply replacement solutions. Um, and one of our overarching goals in uh, developing these conceptual designs and these solutions um, is uh, to have, have a design that could be built, uh, constructed, and uh, be operationally ready uh, day one uh, for any potential breaching of of the dam. So, um, so that's 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 an overarching goal. It does present some unique challenges, uh, and our team is working hard to try to um, develop uh, ideas and uh, strategies for achieving that. Um, right now, we are very much in the middle of, of developing these designs and cost estimates. Uh, team is working really, really hard. It's been mentioned more than once. Uh, this kind of tight timeline. 
but we are very much in the middle of that driving hard towards uh, this draft report uh, to be released at the end of the year. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, um, we're not going to necessarily unveil the uh, solutions that we are developing. Some of those that we're working on actually are uh, being adapted and modified as we speak, uh, just as we learn things, as we try to overcome uh, challenges in terms of uh, in terms of this delivery network and, and whatnot. But but generally speaking, I mean, the ideas encompass a, a lot of different elements, um, you know, obviously looking at new intakes with fish screens, uh, pump stations located in various uh, uh, spots along the corridor here. Um, you know, some some large diameter pipelines, some small diameter pipelines. We've got we we do have a variety as we look at the different pools. You know, Devin talked about the 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 water use, um, and it does vary significantly pool by pool. Um, so the solutions reflect that, and uh, that's what that's what you'll see. Um, there is a solution that we're developing that entails or includes an off-channel reservoir. Um, so again. To, to trying to take a look at the full gamut of possibilities and then uh, and then um, focusing on the ones that have uh, more viability and that's what we're working on. Uh, some of them entail expanding um, you know some you know, existing pump stations uh, and in a few instances it uh, you know just based on that spatial location, water use, uh, the amount of water use associated, you know a, a surface water to groundwater conversion, um, is being explored also and will be presented as, as a potential uh, solution there in, in certain instances. And then there is a solution that we'll be uh, presenting that may have some applicability in certain locations where the geological conditions uh, are conducive. Um, certainly acknowledging it won't be uh, applicable in all locations, all areas up and down the river, but it is kind of an interesting one to, to um, look at and contemplate um, as a possible possible solution, and that is a stand pipe wet well with a perforated pipe. Um, so, at any rate, that that's one that you'll you'll see included as well. Uh, next slide. Okay. So, moving on to study section four again, actively working on study section four, uh, and and this is uh, this entails looking at those uh, potential implementation issues. Um, and you know during that uh, that uh, transition period uh, during potential breaching, post uh, dam breach scenario, and not really looking at um, how the dams necessarily would be breached or the sequence or the timing and those things. Prior studies and reports have um, contemplated different schemes around that. We're trying to take a look at. Uh, uh, a little bit more, you know, broadly, a little more holistically, uh, and in light of these uh, potential water, uh, water supply replacement solutions, what are some of the implementation uh, impacts that um, that need to be contemplated? Mitigation strategies around those, and and that's where, um, as Devin mentioned earlier, on uh, in, you know, taking a look and understanding the water use uh, that's happening in the McNary Pool. Certainly acknowledging that during that transitionary period and uh, and beyond, there could be some different impacts uh, uh, that need to be contemplated. Uh, one of those being uh, sediment and sedimentation issues. That's uh, that's an uh, an area that we're focusing on and um, we'll be characterizing uh, as part of that work. Um, and then we are going to be uh, uh, reporting on the NEPA framework. Um, that would serve as kind of that launch pad for any future uh, NEPA uh, NEPA work that that could potentially uh, you know be engaged. Uh, so that's what study section four entails. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, near term work activities, uh, as mentioned earlier, we are going to be uh, continuing with uh, some water user uh, water user interviews. Uh, a few more words will be shared along those lines. Um, as Devin mentioned, we're very much uh, refining the work uh, for study sections one and two. Uh, that'll be ongoing. Study sections three and four, as you heard me say, very, very active right now. 
all driving towards uh, that draft report uh, that will be issued towards the end or at the end of the year. And with that, I believe I'm turning it back over to Roland. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Perrin. Thank you. Thanks to the uh, Jacobs team for your work and your presentation today. Um, just as a reminder regarding future engagement, uh, we will be releasing the, the draft of this study by the end of the year, and we will be scheduling public information session open houses in the January, February timeframe during that draft review period, which we expect to be about two months long. Um, we expect to have those sessions in the uh, Tri-Cities area and in the Lewiston area, but we will share information as that planning progresses. And you can find that on the website, which will be on the next slide. And maybe if you just wanted to advance to that next slide, there's the, uh, the website. It was also included in the news release uh, for this meeting. Um, Recognizing that the question posted, you know, there was a question posted at the beginning of the meeting, uh, a recording of this meeting will be posted on the study website, as well as on other information that we have there. Uh, we do want to be the study to be as strong as possible. So you can email a reclamation on the study at the usbr.gov address you see there. And you can also uh, email uh, Cynthia, who presented and is leading the outreach team at that second email address. Uh, we do look forward to sharing the draft report in just a few short months and seeing many of you in the new year at those in-person open houses on the draft report. Again, I want to thank you for joining us today and for your interest and engagement in the study. And uh, I will pass it over to uh, Carl Rains from the Department of Ecology uh, to close us out. Thank you, Roland. Uh, Tom unfortunately had to drop off for another obligation, but asked me to just express his gratitude to the uh, collective team working on this. Uh, Partner, our partnership with Reclamation and certainly the Jacobs team is, uh, as everyone can see here, has been putting in a lot of effort. So we thank everyone uh, for your particip participation and ongoing interest in this project and look forward to talking to you again soon. So with that, I think we can adjourn. <laughs>